Welcome back to another episode of Money Talks. This is Hugh Meyer. Hope you're doing well. Remember, we are connecting entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and business experts to you, the small business owner. Super excited today to have my guest, Janie Stahl. Janie is a CEO, a fractional CFO in the Midwest. In our episode today, Janie and I will discuss the three ways she makes business owners self-sufficient how she has managed through COVID times and how she's done such a remar remarkable job with her social media and her websites. We hope you enjoy this episode. Janie, welcome to the Money Talks podcast. How are you doing today? Good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it was great. Great to have you here today. It was great to connect with you on Instagram. Uh, you're doing a great job with your content there. It's amazing how many people I've been meeting over the last year who really are producing some, you know, authentic, as I like to say, content there. And it's, it's even better when, you know, I get to connect with those people and bring them on the podcast. So thank you again for being here today. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the compliment. And so uh, without further ado, let's just get a little bit, let's get started. And just, can you tell me a little bit about your background or tell the audience about your background? Sure. So um, I'm a business uh, coach and strategist and a virtual CFO for small business owners. Um, so I work with service-based businesses in the U.S. And um, I'm really trying to help them make profitable decisions and get that, that time freedom. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really amazing. I'm sure you have a multitude of stories from a year ago. And there's been so much growth in the last 12 months in small businesses and people are, which is great. I mean, there's a great, this entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial spirit is amazing, but with that comes a heavy set of responsibilities and you have a, a very unique background as far as really helping people really manage their business so they can run it most efficiently. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So um, I started with, I grew up on a farm and so I started working with farmers. And so their um, accounting is a little bit more complex, but I realized that all business owners, regardless of the industry, once they got things going, it seemed to be um, people struggled with making decisions. And so when I was helping farmers, we were hedging. And so we had this life cycle of um, like the investment cycle of, you know, if the market went up and they sold, they were kicking themselves. And so I was able to look at their production, look at their financials. And based on those projections, we could make smarter decisions. And so I could reassure them and say, no, remember, that was a good decision. We made that for a reason. We locked in at this price, or we were able to hedge that risk. Um, and so from there, I started getting interest from other industries and other service businesses. And so um, I started working with some marketing agencies. And I really, I found a passion with, with those agencies who had teams. I love that dynamic that brings into it. And as a small business owner, you wear a lot of hats. And so you are making all the decisions and it can get overwhelming very quickly. <laughs> um, so it's just providing the data behind those decisions so that they are empowered and they feel confident and clarity when they are making those decisions that they know it was it was right and it was profitable. Yeah, that sounds like a very very familiar discussion that I have and my partners have with with our own clients during our day to day about you know making these decisions. Albeit it's same same situations. They're they're fa obviously families are involved. They're making big decisions as far as whether it's managing for their their personal assets or more often it's it's in their business and how to make, you know, make these strategic decisions, but do it with, with that information at hand. So they're not having that, you know, why did I do that moment, you know, a year, two years down the road, and you've had some, a very sim sim similar set of experiences with, with the clients that you've worked with. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So let's just, I always like to go back and unfortunately, unfortunately go back to 2020 with all my guests, because everyone has a really unique I guess, story or, you know, set of just tales to tell about, you know, how they managed last year, their own businesses and how they helped manage their clients. So maybe do you want to talk a little bit about how, you know, COVID-19 impacted what you do? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so for me, I was in a fortunate position where uh, with the Paycheck Protection Program, um, a lot of businesses wanted to receive those funds. And so 
They were in a hurry to get their financials in order so that they could apply. Um, so my business did well, fortunately, in 2020. Um, and uh, I was able to help my clients with, I'm very proud to say that they all stayed in business. And I think it came back to that we were prepared for this. So yeah. I had been telling them all along, like, this is why we forecast best case, worst case scenarios, so that if an emergency comes up or if something happens, if we do have an economic recession, that way we're able to make a decision quickly and pivot quickly. So um, I think a lot of their success was attributed to that. And, you know, they're also just very smart strategic business owners. Um, so, you know, they were well-rounded and I don't want to say that it was all because of me, but um, I think that is a big part of being able to survive those, those recessions and those economic downturns. Yeah. Well, the, you know, definitely give yourself a pat on the back. I mean, you're, you're a great, re, <laughs> you're a great resource. I, I also want to give you kudos. Your website is tremendous. I, I've been on it a couple of times. It's just, it's, very, it's how it's how websites for people who are you know we're all in some form or another in the sales business right we're trying to you know sell mm -hmm. ourselves to someone where we can be a resource where we can be a solution and you have a very specific you know tone and direction on of your of your site and what you do and your experience and uh, honestly more people who run businesses should have websites like yours it's it's not overly flashy it's very personable as you show your family but you also really list like you get down to the nitty-gritty this is what i do and this is how i can help you and this is my experience you're putting a number to it you're putting you know real data behind it and i feel like I would assume you've had a lot of success of people just going and seeing your website. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, I, I would like that to be the case right now it's word of mouth. So um, it just comes with like, I'm so grateful to my clients and I learned so much from them um, and with great clients comes great referrals. So it's, it's been a great domino effect. Yeah. And, and to go back to something you were talking about a minute or two ago about it, you, the idea of being really proactive, what you were describing, what you had executed with your clients, that's, it's like exactly how we look at what, you know, what we're doing because our, our philosophy is it's been much too difficult to, you know, over time historically to really gain risk with their, with people on their financial assets. It's much more prudent and safe, if you will, to plan for uncertainty. So, you know, if you're running businesses and God forbid, hopefully we don't have another pandemic like last year, but if you are prepared and your assets and liabilities to, to sound very rudimentary are, are matched that your assets can support your liabilities then no matter what's happening in the world. And obviously last year was the most extreme case you can continue with mm -hmm. your life. And that's, it sounds like that's why your clients continued to be so successful and steady last year was because of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I come from a, a asset management background. Um, and so this stuff has been intuitive to me and I've, I've appreciated the ability to really dive into businesses and into their business financials and helping these business owners really implement it. I think a lot of people you know, we're all, if you're a business owner, you're probably very growth minded. And so it can be challenging when you have all right. this information circling around you and coming at you. And so it's just helpful to have that really like a strategic partner, somebody that you can lean on, whereas you can't ask your employees for advice, um, but you can get that second opinion and just have a partner to help you implement it and make sure that you're on track. Yeah, no, I mean, again, that's, that's a complete, truly invaluable piece of work that you do um, for, for business owners, many of which really struggle because they don't know how to reach out to people like yourself to, to really make what they do more efficient because in the end, it's going to make them more profitable and it's going to make them have a better life. So, you know, more people should be reaching out to, to, to you and, you know, learning more about what you do. So as we kind of dovetail there, Talk about, talk a little bit about these, these actions you take as far as making business owners and CEOs more efficient or self-sufficient in what they do and kind of how you, how you work, interact with them. 
Yeah. So, um, like I said, when business owners, once they get off the ground and things are going well, as we've seen, sometimes the cash flow can't keep up. And so people get to a threshold where they started a business because they were passionate about it. And, you know, most business owners, like they're the technical person, they're the, they're right. passionate about it, but maybe they don't have, they're not well equipped or have all the skills necessary to run a business and keep it profitable. <laughs> so, um, when they get to this threshold of like, oh my gosh, you know, I can't really spend as much time with my family as I wanted. And I started this business because I was passionate about it, but now I'm working 80 hours a week and this is not what I ever wanted. So it it comes to a point where you have to figure out how do I be profitable, but become more efficient within my business. And so I really try to walk through three main steps or three things that, um, three areas to look at within a business in order to have their business be more self-sufficient so that they can have that time freedom, but their business is also profitable and, and, um, sustainable. Yeah. So if we want to dive in, um, I would say (laughs) the very first thing that we look at is, uh, is operations. So, um, with this, uh, it depends on, so I'm going to talk in the context of service-based businesses, because that's okay. what I primarily work with. Um, and so with any type of industry, with any business, your operations, I would say like, if you look at a pillar or a pyramid of your business, I think finances is the foundation. So right. you are not going to succeed if you do not have strong financials. Um, if you don't have a healthy cash flow, if you don't have a healthy profit margin, um, and you don't understand your numbers or know what's going on within your business, you're probably not going to make it past that three year or five year mark. Um, the second like tier up would be operations. And so there are so many expenses um, and and this attributes to the profit margin heavily. So if you're trying to think about how can I set up my business to run on its own, I would ask um, your listeners or business owners to evaluate their operations and think about their processes. And I would encourage them to even try to map them out in a process flow diagram. I know it sounds um, very simple, but through doing that, you can identify where are their bottlenecks? Can we set up um, Zapier or can we have um, a more streamlined process where there aren't so many bottlenecks and it's very easy to even get the sale, right? So like the more hurdles that you have in order to, for a customer or a client to pay you, the less likely it is that you're going to receive that sale. So outline their processes and evaluate where there are bottlenecks which points uh, could be streamlined or automated. And with that, which tools could they use that um, can help streamline or automate those processes? Are there there specific, you know, technology applications that you would suggest or that you recommend, you know, describing kind of or helping what you're just discussing? Yeah. So I'm sure you're familiar with um, a lot of these CRM systems, Um, but I would say sometimes I get pushed back on like these online tools, but with COVID-19 and so many businesses going online, I think it highlighted that it is very possible to do a lot of business (laughs) online and you really can find some operational efficiencies by going that route. So with like financial services, um, CRM systems like Salesforce, I'm sure you're familiar with those. Um, but if you think about the process and like from lead to prospect to client to managing the client, if you were to look at that process flow, I would say there are for online businesses, um, you know, just scheduling. So I'll walk through my process. I, someone goes to my website, they use Acuity to get on my calendar. They have to fill out a form, um, that gives me all the information that I need. I can show up to the discovery call with what I need to know. I already have um, all of the information that I need. Um, and then I'm able to send them an invoice and collect payment as soon as possible, right? So I'm trying to remove as many hurdle- hurdles 
from lead to client. Um, and then in terms of invoicing, um, I see a lot of people who are using so many different systems that will yeah. do one particular part when you can have one system that does right. the majority of it. And if we're looking at cutting expenses too, like it's very common for me to review a client's um, expenses and look at all the tools they're using. And I'm like, you're using five tools and they all do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, so, I, I can only imagine. Yeah. Yeah. So my favorites are like for invoicing and for bookkeeping um, and project management. I prefer uh, to use like QuickBooks. And then even I know that again, this sounds simple, but even a lot of people are using like Dubsado and HoneyBook when really you could be using QuickBooks for your invoicing, your payroll, your bookkeeping, um, your timekeeping. <laughs> And then you could be using like Google Suite and then Zapier is a tool that will automate like certain triggers. Um, and so those are my two favorite tools that I recommend to most service businesses. No, that was great. It's uh, That's one of my other I guess, passions as I'm doing the podcast is talking to business owners about what technologies they're either using or and you know, it's more it's important that they've been using it so they can talk intelligently about it and recommend it to their clients and other business owners because we've as I one of the common themes I've discussed is we've we seem to have moved from this hundred percent kind of analog world into this almost fully digital world. And mm -hmm. obvi obviously, you know, being mostly do, most people have been doing work from their I mean, majority of people have been doing work from their own homes or by themselves in an office. They had to learn and become more accustomed to using digital technology to to run their businesses. And I'm sure if they've absorbed and gravitated toward that direction, it's probably paid off it, or and it will pay off in the long run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I I mean, I'm working with very successful clients. And I love it when, when somebody who's doing really well can, you know, that Google suite is not beneath them. <laughs> I mean, they're successful because they have that mentality of like, why would I pay $200 a month for something right. I can get for free or that I can get for $10 a month? Yeah, absolutely. Is, can you, is there any other uh, points you, as far as you want to make in regards to your process, uh, you, as far as you went through finance and operations, are there any other important kind of steps or pieces you like to, you know, be on top of with respect to your, with respect to your clients? Yeah. So the other part to operations, um, like I said, uh, there'd be three main parts that I would look at within operations. The other thing is um, looking at your, your, your processes and your procedures. So I already talked about outlining your, your process flow, um, but then also having procedures. So this is going to tie into my second um, point, which is your team. That's a good way to try to get your business to run on its own. And so if you're going to bring on team members or you want your team members to be more efficient, at some point you will need procedures. And again, I feel like some entrepreneurs are like, oh, that's so corporate-y. <laughs> I come from the SEC mindset of like, you have to have <laughs> procedures. You have to have everything documented. Right. Um, but it's just good practice. And even for um, small business owners, regardless of the industry, when we have, when everybody on the team knows like, this is where, you know, right. pictures are saved in Dropbox. Um, documents, client files are stored in Google Drive, and we are encrypting these files. And this is, um, these are the procedures for every single task. I think a lot of business owners recognize that turnover is high. That's the reality of, of employing other people. Right. And so, you know, if you can do something to bring in that next person and make your job a little bit less painful and help them get onboarded quickly, then I think procedures is just a no brainer. Yeah, I, I agree. Absolutely. And I love how you keep, you know, hammering home yeah, that idea that it, you got to write it down. I mean, everybody, you know, not to say we all live in the cloud <laughs> with all our data <laughs> or ourselves, but it seems like many businesses you know, don't have procedures and everything organized. It just, I know it seems so obvious, but I'm sure you've seen it from the work you do that 
for whatever reason, they're more, they're, they're more apt to wanting to think about profits and making money and as opposed to, well, building those blocks that will sustain you for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's like what Kobe Bryant and all the greats would say, like the reason they were great was because they practiced the rudimentary and the very simple things over and over and over again. And I think it's the same for business where there's a reason that companies, manufacturing companies invest in lean initiatives and in uh, Sigma and, and those things, because they know in the end, it does produce hard dollars. Absolutely. As far as how, what has been the mindset of your, of your clients? I mean, obviously it's been a whirlwind last 12, 13 months. How, what is their, what's the kind of their feeling, their outlook as far as their businesses going into, you know, the rest of this year and, and beyond? So um, we try to, I mean, I have my own opinion of, you know, a, a forecast of, you know, nobody has a crystal ball, but right. um, I always, you know, hope for the best, but plan for the worst, <laughs> as cliche as that saying is. Um, but so we always like to have at least two years, month by month, mapped out of revenue, expenses, um, high level strategy, and um, maybe a little bit more uh, tactical things too, of like how we're going to run the business. Um, and then we always keep a pulse on every year. We like to do a SWOT analysis. Again, it's something simple, but we're looking at, all right, you know, if there was an economic, economic downturn, if COVID continues, um, what are some opportunities that we have here? Where are some gaps that we highlighted last year that we need to close up or, you know, are we kind of starting to pivot and going in a different direction? Right. And maybe what we were doing in 2020 is not even relevant anymore. Um, right. So we're looking at the the economy, we're looking at our competitors, um, and then we're also looking at our business and what we're doing well. And, um, you know, just financially, like what can we afford and where are there opportunities for reinvestment or for growth? No, that that's a great. So I don't know if that answers your question, but no, ab no, absolutely. I mean, I think that I think that's uh that's excellent that you have that pro that process is everything that you have in place that you're constantly, you know, you're being proactive and not reactive, and that's when in doubt, that's going to definitely be a more a, a winning strategy over a long period of time of you know always looking trying to, you know, tighten things up and being on top of all different processes and being able to, you know, recommend different technology that may make the business more efficient. So, you know, that's, that's great that you, you that you continue to do that with your clients. I'm sure they recognize that. So I always, uh, I spend so much time asking my guests questions. I always like to turn it around and give the guests the mic and get the time to ask me a question if they would like. So the, the floor is yours. Okay, sure. Um, well, first, I mean, I think a lot of people in the financial services arena are hesitant to be active on social media and through a podcast because of the compliance regulations and requirements. Um, so I'm curious how you have navigated that and how, if you have found any efficiencies within those processes. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So just to give a little background, I spent 90... 5% of my career in large institutions. And only in the last two years did I go from, you know, one of the largest institutions to a 40-year-old a private uh, RIA outside of Los Angeles. So much, you know, a, 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 going from a very large ocean to a small pond, if you will, and the mm -hmm. event, and there's there's a lot of advantages to that. I mean, the reason, the predominant reason why I did it was for my clients. You know, the culture of larger institutions, um, in my opinion, has has really withered over a long period of time. More about profit center and a lot less about their clients. And with that, you know, like to your point, you know, compliance of social media, you know, within institutional firms is is. It was more restrictive. It's become a little bit less so, but if I had been still working for an institution previously, I wouldn't be doing this right now. I don't know any brokers, if you will, that are doing podcasts. Um, 
And I wanted to, when I did this, I wanted to take a different spin on it because this, I, I started this about nine months ago. I'm closing in on 60 episodes now. And the reason why I started this was because I reached out to another colleague of mine, and this was last March of last year, it was in April, who, and he wrote an article at the time, which I always give him the kudos because he inspired all this, is he wrote an article and I said, listen, you know, not enough people are going to read this. We need to talk about it live. So that's what we did. We did a webinar and one webinar became another one, which became another one. And now I'm sitting here in the studio of my team that helps me do this. And, you know, they convinced me that it could had to be a, a twice a week thing, not a once a month uh, kind of project. And because where I work, I have the liberty to, to do this. And I'm not, I, I'm very specific. I'm not on here to sell people on, uh, I'm not here to sell financial advice. I'm here to connect people like yourself who could be a resource to my audience. And to me, that's a lot more, you know, fulfilling than the, than the latter. So that's, one of the primary reasons why my business partner and compliance officer, uh, you know, bless this because again, this is about, you know, my partners and myself connecting you to people that may need your services. And that's really why I started this last year is because people needed help. They needed other resources. They needed to, maybe they needed to learn something. Maybe they need to start a, a business but they needed access to resources. And I feel like that's, you know, that's what I'm doing here. That's great. That's awesome that you were able to um, find something that you like doing and that you're able to serve your audience in this capacity and that you got the approval too. (laughs) Win, win, win. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's definitely, it's, 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 it's fun for me because I, you know, I love, I get to meet different people, you know, every week um, and different, areas of social media, whether it's on Instagram, like yourself, now Clubhouse is becoming um, mm-hmm. a pretty, a pretty, you know, uh, influential, you know, piece of social media. And I, I've met people there that I actually have brought onto my podcast as well. So uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun and, and I, and I enjoy it. Yeah, that's great. I would agree. I think, you know, as long as you, it's like the glass is half full, right? A lot of people will say social media is negative, but if you're using it in the right way and to connect, um, then it can be a really powerful tool. hundred percent. Just, you know, keep it, keep it positive and stay away from the, the political. <laughs> and, and, and I think, you'll pro- I think you'll probably be okay. So uh, yeah, yeah. No, thank, thank you for that. So let's, let's circle back to you and, and, talk a little bit more, there's a couple more pieces to the pie, if you will, um, regards to our discussion. So why don't you uh, take it, take it, take it back. Okay. So first I would dive into the operations. The second piece to getting your business to be more self-sufficient is looking at your team. So, um, if you haven't already hired contractors, uh, so just, I think most people know this, but a W-2 employee is you're paying their, their benefits, their Medicare right. and social security attendant nine contractor. You're not. So for a lot of people, they will start with hiring contractors, um, just because they can't afford a full-time W-2 employee. So I would look at, um, you know, a lot of the buzzword is passive income, but really, if you think about it, if you have team and you can duplicate yourself almost that is a way of having passive income. So of course you have the cost of paying them. Um, but if you're being smart about it, then you should have them doing the tasks that you are not good at right? and that you don't like doing. And then that bringing on that person should enable you to grow. So the, as far as the logistics, like I do work with clients on, can we afford this, you know, what kind of role is this and what would we have to pay somebody and how many hours are they going to be working and like, which tasks are they doing? And so I like to say that the business owner should be focused on the lucrative activities, right? Right. So it doesn't make sense to have the business owner answering phone calls or um, doing the bookkeeping. So I would look at um, 
you know, what are some of those tasks that you don't like doing that you're not good at and that are low ROI? So return on investment, like the least lucrative activities. Those would be the items that I recommend business owners either outsource or if they can afford it and it's equivalent to like 40 hours per week, then hire a W-2 employee to help them. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I agree. It's it's all about being efficient and maximizing. My my one of my favorite words people know me for is le- is leverage, and I don't mean you know borrowing money. Leverage, I mean leverage of your time, leverage of your content, leverage of your resources. That's what I'm. That's what I'm referring to. So I think that's uh, a key point. Hmm. Yeah. So I think we've all you know, most people are familiar with the Eisenhower matrix. It's like the, the table of four things where, um, look at, in addition to trying to figure out like which tasks you are going to outsource or delegate, um, you can also look at the Eisenhower matrix. So it's, you know, is this important and is it urgent? Okay. Then you need to do that. And I would say too, like the lucrative activities are also going to fit within that (laughs) box. If it's important, um, but it's not urgent, then you can do it, but do it later. Um, and then for your bottom two tiers, if it's not important and it's a low um, ROI task, um, or it's something that um, uh, it's not urgent, not important, then those are the things that you need to just eliminate or outsource altogether, right. or you scratch it off for now. Um, I think a lot of business owners are overwhelmed a majority of the time and 2020 was definitely like the peak of that. And so just give yourself permission that, you know what, it's not the end of the world. If I come back to that podcast next year, or if I, um, you know, don't implement that lean initiative this year, like I need to be focused on the things that are going to move the needle the furthest in my business. Yeah, that's those are all really great points. Definitely things that all business owners need to to keep in mind. So thank you for that. So as we're concluding, I always like to see have the guests. You know, pro, you provided some really great pieces of actionable advice, but I always like to leave with one final piece, if you will. So I thank you again for being here. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. I would close that close it out with saying the third piece that business owners can look at is um, productizing their services. So looking at, um, if you read the book Built to Sell, the the premise is that if you are going to sell a service-based business, then it needs to be something that is like a system that somebody can duplicate. And so even if you don't envision selling your business within the next five or 10 years or ever, it's a good practice to productize your services. So get it to a point where people can understand, they can see the price, they know which um, services are included in that package. And it just makes it easy for them to compare and figure out what is a good solution for them. Um, I think in this day and age, people want that information. And if that's not on your website, or if you can't (laughs) give them your price, like the time of day, they're going to move on. They're not going to get waste their time getting on a phone call. Um, So it just makes the sell easier and it makes it easier for your team then to implement, right? So if you have your invoicing and you have all your processes um, down to a T and you have procedures then your team can help you execute. And so not everything is dependent on you. Yeah, no, that was, that was excellent. That's a great way to end it. Um, it. You know, thank you again, Janie, for being here. It was great to finally meet you in person. And there was, there was a ton of great advice here and content. I really look forward to, you know, going back through it all. And you know, let, you know, staying in contact with you, and you know, learning, continuing to learn about what you're working on with your clients. So, thank you again for being here today. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. I'm honored. Thank you again. So, again, thank you for being here today. This is another episode of Money Talks, and we'll be back next week with another episode. Please remember to like and subscribe on our YouTube channel, and we'll be back in again next week. Remember, this is Money Talks. Take care. <laughs>